pray together this morning. <clears throat> Father, we, uh, we are humbled as we gather together, Lord, that we have the privilege and the freedom to come together without danger, without life-threatening situations upon us, Father, we, we really take for granted many times our freedom and our safety. Father, it, it, it is a blessing, but it can also be, a, in some ways, a curse in the sense that we get very, very comfortable. And Father, help us to just understand that all of this is by your hand, and, and our safety, our comfort, our protection is all you. And at any point, that could be taken away. Father, it is so good to hear, to get a better perspective from others who live in these parts of the world where there is always fighting. It seems like constant war. People killing one another. Right in front of, right in front of other people. Friends killed. Family members killed. And Lord, we we want to many times shelter ourselves or even shelter our children from things like this. And Lord, I don't know if that's always right. This is part of the sin-cursed world. This sin that has brought all of this into, into creation. All this fight and killing, bloodshed. Father, help us to be in prayer for all of those around the world that are involved with this. And Lord, as we, as we come this morning, there are many that are on our hearts and minds that we continue to pray for. We continue to lift up by name, Brad, Brian Holt. And Father, we continue, we lift up the family of Bruce and friends of Bruce as he is Past, Lord, we, we pray that you comfort all those near and dear to him and uh, just keep them in your hands, Lord. We continue to lift up Elmer King's granddaughter, Lord, as we are hearing that she, she is getting better, we thank you for that. And we just ask for your continued uh, healing and blessing upon her and the family. Father, we continue to lift up Glenn Hay who is still dealing with infection. And Father, we ask that you, uh, through the doctors who are caring for him, uh, heal that. Help him to recover, Lord. We continue to lift up Julie McDowell, who is also dealing with cancer. And Father, we, uh, we hate that word. And Lord, we, uh, we just ask that you uh, continue to heal her in that and uh, help her in all of that and those around her and keep her in your hands Lord uh, we are thankful for Judy Steyer and her uh, recovery and just uh, it is just a wonderful testimony of your, of your healing, of your power of your grace Lord we do continue to lift up Marvin Creek and we ask for you to move within him and Mike Cooley, Father, we uh, again ask for your hand in his uh, dealing with his cancer. Father, we continue to lift up Miles Resch. Father, help him uh, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. And Lord, uh, we do lift up the family uh, of Patsy Turner. And uh, we lift up everyone else who, who loves her dearly as well, Father. Help, help all of us and all of them to mourn uh, healthy, in a healthy way, to, to remember her, to speak of her, to, to laugh when talking, when telling stories, and to just uh, remember all about her, who she is, because she is not gone. She is with you, Father. 
Lord, we continue to lift up Sandy, Lawyer, and ask that you uh, heal and bring uh, relief to the pain in her neck and Shirley Jordan. Uh, we ask for your relief there as well. And Lord, Terry Bacon, as he continues to recover at home, Father, uh, we ask your hand to be upon him uh, continually. And Lord, Violet Holland, uh, who is still in need of your grace and mercy and uh, healing as well. Father, we ask that it be your will that this healing comes upon the people that are suffering. And Lord, all those around the world that are dealing with war and fighting, we also lift up them. Those that are that are involved but uh, not doing the fighting, they're suffering, Father, on both sides. Father, help us to discern who to pray for and uh, we in and of ourselves don't know who is right and who is wrong. We can only pray for your wisdom and your guidance and your mercy and for you to intervene, Father, throughout the whole thing on both sides. Lord, and we do thank you for all you've done, all that you are. And Lord, we, we know that those that have passed on are in a better place. And Father, that is only because of Jesus Christ and all that he has done. And Lord, what an amazing, glorious message of good news that is, that we have this hope. And Father, we come now before you with, as one body, with one voice, saying the words that Jesus taught his disciples. Father, Our Father, who art in heaven, be thy name.
Father, we confess these things to you, and we know that it is only through Christ that it is forgiven forever, and it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Our assurance this morning. The 
people. Yeah. Oh, you were about to say you had all morning. It just it just didn't come out quite quick enough. Huh? Yeah. So it's the people, and Jesus said that he or he was the cornerstone. All right, that he was the cornerstone of the church. Because the church really isn't a building. Did you know that? It's, it's not a building. This is a building for the church. But we kind of mixed this all up and made it like the church is a building. It's the people. Did you know that where we get the word church from is a Greek word that really just means assembly. So it's just a group of people. And in this case, it's specifically the people of God, right? So the church isn't a building. It's the people. And Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the one that holds everything together, right? Yeah. So yeah, he's not, he's not a literal stone out here on the building somewhere. He's, it's just something that is used to kind of show how important, because the cornerstone is really important, right? It's just used to show how important Jesus really is. Right? Sometimes we talk like that. Okay? Can you pray with me this morning? Father, we do thank you. We thank you that Jesus is the one that, that holds all things together, that holds the church, the people together when we are focused and fully following him. And Lord, we thank you for these children, and we continue to ask that you stir in their hearts you, by the Spirit, and you, uh, you cause them to turn and come to you. And Father, as parents and, and the church, that we help them to grow to know you and understand you through your word. Because your word is all true, and it's all about you. Father, we thank you for all of it. And we pray it all in the one who is the rock, the cornerstone, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. scripture this morning comes from the book of Ephesians chapter 2 verses 19 through 22 so then you are no longer strangers and aliens but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the people of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. To him, in him, you also are built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit.
pray together again this morning. Father, again we thank you. We thank you for this time to, to look to your word and see what you have for us this morning. Father, if anything that I say is not correct, may it be corrected. And anything that I say is not worthy of your glory, of your honor, may it be cast out and forgotten. Father, may this be your message, your words. May I just be a vessel. Father, we come before you humbly. May our ears be open, our minds be able to understand and our hearts be softened this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. David wrote in Psalm 133, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is, it is beautiful uh, to see and to experience unity. It is something that the, the church desperately needs to work on. It is something that really can't be neglected. Uh, unity is something that takes effort and humility. It, it takes surrender to Christ and to others over one's own opinions and desires. And no one can really attain this through human effort alone. We can't do this on our own. It takes a, a common focal point to being united. Paul, Paul knew this, and that's why he spent time writing about it to the churches. He, this unity comes through Christ. He is to be the focal point. The true oneness comes only through him. And this is, this is the third week that we're kind of looking at this section here that I talked about of Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. And this whole passage can be seen as Paul talking uh, to the church about uh, being one in Christ. And this is a consistent theme that through this letter and elsewhere in Scripture, Paul, Paul is writing to the church, and we believe that he is specifically writing to the church in Ephesus, but it was also likely that this was uh, a letter that would circulate through other churches in the surrounding area. Um, and oneness in Christ is crucial for the church, and all churches need to be sure that Christ is the central focus upon which everything is done. The church is the church of Christ, the body of Christ. The, the people are the body of Christ. And we know, we saw that Paul started this section uh, with speaking to the Gentiles. And then the passage we looked at last week that uh, focused both more on both the Jews and the Gentiles. And now this week, uh, the passage focuses back on the Gentiles here in verse 19. Paul ends this section with a metaphor then, and he uses different metaphors for the church at times in his letters. And this one, we will see, speaks... Uh, pretty strongly to us in our situation, I think. It's interesting how this landed. Uh, first, though, he again speaks to the joining of the Gentiles into God's people. Paul is again pointing out the inclusion of the Gentiles into God's family. He writes that they are no longer strangers and aliens. And these two words have the idea of being foreigners in a land or even of a country. It's not where you uh, uh, were born or, or live. It could be in the context of one living actually in a place that they aren't citizens. The Gentiles were foreigners to God's country, so to speak. They, they didn't belong because of, of heritage. They were on the outside. They were outsiders. They were not included. Paul then says that they are fellow citizens now with the saints and members of the household of God. And that means they are seen as part of the family. The citizenship has now changed. And he continues this idea of going from outside to inside. And they, they've been moved from far from God to near to God. We saw that. And Paul uses the wording 
of building uh, of a building structure now. And he speaks about God's household. He uses the parts of a physical building as a metaphor here. And he, he says it's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ being the cornerstone. There's a foundation of the prophets or the apostles and the prophets. And, and this is this includes the twelve apostles that Jesus had chosen to be with him, and maybe some others that he also had with him that he sent out on his behalf. These were also the ones that personally uh, witnessed the resurrection. And the prophets are those that brought God's message to the people. That's what prophets did. There, there have been many prophets throughout the, the history of God's people. And many of these uh, we are given in our scriptures were directly from God. And uh, sometimes it would be foretelling and sometimes it would be foretelling. Foretelling is telling something that's going to happen in the future. Foretelling is just bringing uh, God's word to the people. I, when I take these tests, these to uh, see what your spiritual gifts are, one of mine is is prophet. I don't know the future, but I see that as to bring God's word to the people. That's the main job of a prophet. That's what a prophet did. Uh, and these words were given through the prophets. Uh, and that is what we see. We have much of it in our scriptures, maybe not everything. The word of God is the foundation of the faith, this word that comes through the prophets and through the apostles. The word came through these people. And now Jesus, being the cornerstone, points to him being the word incarnate. This is all, this is all pointing to God's word. He is the word in the flesh. And when we read John chapter 1, we see that the word became flesh and dwelt among us in verse 14. He, he is the crucial part of the foundation. It interlocks the other blocks at the corner to strengthen the whole structure. And he is the strength that holds together the people of God. And then again, Paul speaks of what, uh, is to be, uh, what it is to be in Christ. Using, moving further with this building metaphor. It is in Jesus that this structure grows into this holy temple to God. This is the dwelling place for God by the Holy Spirit, he says. And if God has a, a dwelling space, place where his spirit dwells. And Paul writes this same thing in the first letter to the Corinthian church. He asks them this, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For the temple is holy and you are that temple. He is speaking to them as a group, but he is communicating that each part of the whole houses the Holy Spirit. Paul talks about this again in chapter 6 of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. It's in a different sort of context talking about uh, sexual immorality. And he says in verse 19 of chapter 6, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. And speaking of a temple, would bring to mind the temple in Jerusalem. And this would be appropriate uh, also for the tabernacle, but the temple was more relevant because this uh, was been possibly still standing at the time of this letter, depending on what, what date you take this letter to be written. The temple was the place where God's spirit dwelt. Uh, that is until the ark was gone. Uh, the spirit of God was in the, the temple as long as the ark was there in the holy of holies, or the most holy place, the center room, or the, the further back room of the temple that only the high priest could go only once a year. And this place was holy, it was sacred, it was, it was the house of God for him to be as close to the people as possible, actually without harming them. Sin couldn't dwell in God's presence. God's spirit dwells in sinlessness, and humanity uh, being tainted with sin in every part would not survive in the presence of his holiness. 
And that all changed through Christ. No longer is there this separation between God and his people. Being in Christ makes um, the new residence of the Holy Spirit inside the believer. The building is now the people. And you know, I really think this is appropriate for us this morning. Paul uses this metaphor of a building. And we're building buildings. And, and we're familiar with the foundation of a building. You know, right now, that is what we have. We have a foundation. And we can sit here and dwell on the fact that the foundation is all we have, or we can look at it as we have arguably the most crucial part of the building in place ready to be built upon. The foundation is laid. This is where everything will stand or fall. And this is this holds up everything else. We, we have a foundation, and we have a solid foundation that will stand the test of time. It, it may not last forever, and it won't last forever, as nothing in this life does, but it's solid. And maybe God in this is continuing to just grow our faith through trial. And I know there is frustration. There has been some frustration because that foundation has been ready for about two weeks now. And it's ready to be built upon. And we, we get anxious and to get this going, to get to even see this directed, and we're so we're so ready to worship in that place. And that's not a bad thing. But again, we are maybe to wait. And what might God be revealing in our waiting? Maybe, maybe we need to stop and recenter on, on the only foundation that really is eternal. Do we really truly believe that God has all of this in his hands? Do we believe that God needs us to make things happen in order to get this done? The reality is we can't make things happen unless God allows it to happen, really. It's, it's all in his control. And, you know, we must understand that this world does not need, this is, this is one that, that, that may kind of rub, this world does not need our building. This community does not need our building. This building must be seen as a tool for worship and never an object of worship. And when we start really getting focusing or focused on the building too much so that uh, we get anxious and frustrated. It's time to maybe reevaluate our motivation and desires. Um, and I, I, this, first of all, has convicted me this past week because I am one that was getting anxious and, and maybe a little frustrated, to be honest. And I, I, I was not motivated necessarily by God's will, but by my own desires. And I have my own opinions of how things should go or are supposed to go. And uh, honestly, this, this is very self-centered. I'm reminded of, of Paul's words to the Philippian church in chapter 4, 4 through 7. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made to give note to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I really, you know, as we all do, want to see this building get built. And I want to see it happen in my time. And that, that, I think, works because my timing is the right time. And, you know, God knows how to get my attention. And he, he is gentle, but he is extremely convicting in revealing my self-centeredness. And I know that this building is all in God's hands and his timing, and he sometimes needs to remind me of that. And I, I say all of us of that. And we are so anxious about this because it is it, it is a big deal. It will be worth celebrating, and you know. But think about this. God, from the very beginning, had a plan to save people. Did he do it in a hurry or a short amount of time? 
No. He took a pretty long time to do this. Paul uses the metaphor of, of a building. He writes that the foundation was the apostles and the prophets. And I believe that he is referring to the prophets throughout the Old Testament, throughout, you know, Moses is even considered to talk about as a prophet, um, and the apostles in the New Testament then. And these are the foundation of God's church. And how long did it take to build that foundation? We can't be certain on the number of years from creation to the time of Jesus, but with the genealogy, the scripture, and the events in history, it was at least 6,000 years to as much as 15,000 years. And if we just land in the middle, we can say God took 10,000 years to build the foundation of the church, of his church. And this only reveals God's grace and patience to spend so much time building his building. His people are his building. The church is built on a foundation of people with each building block being a person. Who we are, we are who we are in Christ. Like living, we, we, in Christ we are living stones, as Peter writes. In 1 Peter 2, he says, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, talking about Christ, in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, verse 5, like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. The, one who, the ones who are the foundation of a spiritual house aren't the foundation because of being more holy than others. They aren't better. They aren't on another pedestal. It's because of, of what they were called to do. The apostles and prophets brought the word of God to the people. The word of God is the foundation. And the incarnate word of God, Christ, is the cornerstone. He is the, the one holding it all together at the foundation. He, everything stands or falls on the word. And he is the one building his church. He is the one laying each living stone upon this foundation. And God took thousands of years to build the foundation of his church. And he's been building on that foundation for almost 2,000 years more. God's timing is not the same as ours. He, he is in control of all the affairs of men. And this building of ours will be built according to God's will, not ours. And that, that is hard. It's tough. This building is the only house, uh, this, this building is only a house and a part of God's church. And God's church is the people. God's spirit dwells within the people, not in the building. And as I've already said, the world, the world doesn't need our building. What the world needs is Christ. It needs Jesus. And, and we must be continually surrendering to God's will and timing because we do desire that this be built ultimately by Him. In Psalm 127, 1 reads, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. And our surrender to Christ in every aspect of this process will ensure that we aren't building this building in vain. This this world needs Jesus. And when our surrounding community looks at our building, may our prayer be that they see a spiritual house with Christ as the cornerstone. May they see oneness that can only come through Christ. From Him being at the center for surrendering our desires and wills to His. And may they see a collective house that is so united under Christ that they don't even see individuals as much as they see the beauty of the collective whole. When our building is finished, we won't so much see one stone or one piece of siding or one roof shingle. We will see the collective whole of the building that all of these parts unite to form. And we will see the building as one structure made of many parts built on a foundation that holds. 
And may it be the same with our spiritual house. May we be so united in Christ that what others see is a beautiful oneness in Christ. This doesn't mean that each of us is unimportant. We, eat, we have the privilege of being a living stone, Peter says, in a spiritual dwelling of Christ's church that lasts for eternity. And may our oneness in Christ radiate so strongly that our community only sees Jesus. They only see the spiritual house that is built on Jesus, the very word of God in the flesh. He is our rock. He is our cornerstone that holds the whole structure together forever. May God let us be so tightly joined to one another and with Christ, the cornerstone, that New Hope Church is seen as one. And may we be a spiritual house built by God in Christ that only one who can and will build his church. On Christ the solid rock we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you for the building that is happening. And Father, we do ask you to continue to humble us and reveal to us that this is all in your hands. And Father, we also lift up anyone who is not within your spiritual house. Those that are still on the outside, not placing their faith in Christ yet. Father, we make we want we pray that you move within them, stir their hearts to repentance, to turn from this sin to your salvation only comes through Christ and leads to eternity with you in a glorious eternal heaven and earth. Father, we, we lift up anyone within the sound of my voice and pray that you move within them and that if they, if they do feel you stirring within them, that they ask questions, that, that they pray and, and ask uh, that they place their faith and trust in Christ bringing them into this spiritual house, being a living stone forever built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and Christ as the cornerstone, holding it all together forever. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together our next hymn, We Would Be Joe, number four seven.
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Christ Jesus our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Go and serve your Lord. Thank you.